This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas and welcome. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word, uh, or should I say, this is Santa Claus from the North Pole <laughs> for the MagicWordPodcast.com. Thank you very much for coming back again this week and joining us. We are going to have another Murray Christmas. This is something that is our tradition that we've been doing for a number of years, just to kind of listen to what uh, Murray Sawchuck's been doing. But uh, more importantly, or equally important, however you look at it, or less importantly, whatever, he also gives us kind of a status update of what's been happening in Las Vegas over the last year, and also just kind of uh, uh, who's come and gone, and also an idea, because he is such a social animal and uh, called a celebrity magician, of kind of seeing what's working and what doesn't as far as social media. Is TikTok in or out, and YouTube or in or in any you get the idea you'll be hearing it uh, on this episode then as well and also because we are here at the beginning of the holiday season or actually yeah pretty much uh, we're into it uh, and i have been <laughs> working as Santa Claus uh, at uh, Neiman Marcus and from private parties and country clubs. It's been a pretty busy season for me this year. It's interesting about how that I've grown into a completely different profession, if you will, of not doing magic, but actually uh, performing uh, with, uh, inter- not entertaining, but just listening to what people want, what children want uh, for Christmas and helping to uh, spread joy and love throughout the uh, universe of people who come to see me. Uh, anyhow, so this week I do want to talk a little bit about something else that that is a, a very cool trick that is available. There are a lot of new things that are coming out all the time. Well, one of the new things that caught my attention, and that is uh, the Christmas Bandana by Lee Alex. Uh, Lee's been known for some other things, color changing vests and some other stuff that he's done that is, is excellent. But this is something that is uh, coined for the beginners, I should say, it uh, is geared towards beginners because it is a devil's hank, basically. But it's, again, called a Christmas bandana. It's beautifully made, a nice silk handkerchief. Uh, it doesn't really uh, bulge or, you know, sag in the pocket. That's in the middle. But basically, you have a gingerbread man or a gingerbread girl, which you can put in these um, little... Uh, gumdrops and other kinds of things and basically when you pull it out of the bandana now it is a fully decorated and completed gingerbread man or gingerbread girl with uh, little bows in her hair and of course you open the handkerchief and there's nothing else in there i suggest you go to the magic word podcast.com you can see a video of it there in fact don't just uh take my word for it. Listen to what uh, the past national president of the Society of American Magician, uh, Dal Sanders, has to say about it. Hi, I'm Dal Sanders, and if those of you that know me know that I do a lot of kids' magic. And the very first show I ever customized or themed was a Christmas show, so I've had a lot of experience doing a holiday magic over the years, and I just started using the Christmas Bandana by Lee Alex, and I want to say this thing is a winner. I, I got it, and uh, I was playing with it, and I just put it in the, the Christmas show, and I said, let's, let's just try it out immediately immediately went over great. And then later I had a second show and uh, they had cut my time on that one. So I was going to skip over that. But kids came up after the show and said, I, I missed it. Can I see one more thing? And I happened to have that set up. So it was a great impromptu seeming thing to perform too. I've got some great ideas on a presentation with it too. I think they're great. That They'll be great for me. One is uh, I'm going to try setting up both the girl and the boy in the bandana. And then if uh, a girl wants to see the trick, I do it with a girl. If a boy wants to do the trick, I do it with him. But you can feel the pigtails on the side of the uh, girl's head and know if you've got the girl one or the boy one. And I, you know, I hate to, to offer an improvement idea for a, an already fantastic trick, but this is uh, just a fun, fun magic trick when the ideas are, are just endless. I can't wait to see what other people come up with with this one. Anyway, that's my story. I enjoyed the trick very much. Thank you, Lee Alex. 
Thanks, Dal, for your testimonial, and I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will enjoy that trick, too. Well, I think we spent enough time on that. Let's move on to our guest this week. Again, we have Murray Sawchuk from Las Vegas, who is going to update us on kind of what's been going on uh, around Las Vegas, that is, some shows that have opened and closed, as well as perhaps what's going on in social media and what works and doesn't and everything. So let's get right on with this week's episode, and here he is. Please welcome right now my guest, Murray Sawchuk, here on The Magic Word. It is that time of the year in which that we'd like to visit with uh, my buddy uh, Murray Sawchuk out in Las Vegas to find out what's going on and what has been going on during this past year. So it's not only a, a Murray Christmas, but we're just trying to do a recap then also because uh, Las Vegas is the entertainment capital of the world. And I, I really know no one else who has his finger on the pulse of what's happening in Las Vegas better than Murray Sawchuk. Here he is right now. Hey, Murray. How you doing, uh, Scott? You well? <laughs> Merry Christmas to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and a Merry Christmas then to you, too. So oh. I I remember in previous years that uh, from time to time you had been like in the in the parade, like in Los Angeles. And um, I think Masters of Illusion had some per- something in the parade as well. Did, did you do anything there this year at all? They still do. Yeah, they do it every year. Uh, Associated Television, who produces Massive Illusion uh, with David McKenzie and David Martin and all those guys are dear friends of mine. They do it every year. And they usually pick a couple of different magicians each season to go on it where you ride in the car and you do that. So I did it probably about, geez, I want to say five, six years ago or it's something been a like while that. Back. I love it. Yeah, it's been a while time back. flies. <laughs> Boy, does it ever. I love it. And uh, this year they got a couple other magicians there. I'm not sure who it is, but it's, you know, it's one of those things I watched on TV years ago. And I thought, yeah. what a cool thing to go down Hollywood Boulevard during Christmas. Two things I love, Hollywood and Christmas, you know, and as a kid and, you know, pretty cool. So when I got the call to be a part of it, I loved it. The one thing I did not account for though, because you think LA can't get that cold, you know, and don't forget they shoot the Hollywood Christmas parade a day or two before Thanksgiving or a day or two after. So they shoot it a month ahead. And uh, so I wear my blue outfit and I always said, wear a warm jacket. Well, you know, I'm always worried about my appearance, especially if it's on TV. Well, yeah, so I want to wear my blue jacket and the hair up and all that. Right. And not a warm jacket that's kind of gray or black. So I sat in this little MG, like a 19, I don't know, 63 MG or 57. And away we go. And we're going down the strip. And I thought it was just the block. I thought it was from like La Brea, which is, which is kind of like the north end of the strip of Hollywood Boulevard. If no one's been there before, you kind of go in front of Grauman's Chinese theater where all the stands are in the host. You kind of go down to maybe Vine, which is where they have the walk of stars. And then you, that's what I thought it was. And they kind of loop you back. I thought that's kind of what it was. <laughs> I had no idea that the parade goes around about uh, two and a half to four mile block radius going five miles an hour wow. and it takes about two and a half hours and i'll let you know wow. at about 47 degrees fahrenheit <laughs> we're in a, with a little sports coat sitting on a convertible <laughs> mg um i i did not expect how cold it was going to be once we made that right turn i thought oh we're going to loop back to the parking lot we did it for tv we're all doing good and i we make this right turn and i see thousands of people on each side of the street i asked the driver i said well, where are we going now he said oh we're Prayed. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean the whole, I no one. I don't, maybe I didn't read the instructions, but, um, <laughs> so we just kept going. I said, well, when do we end? I said, oh, this whole thing takes about two and a half hours, three. And I am freezing at this point. We've only gone four blocks and I'm freezing. <laughs> so the whole time you ever see me in that picture and that I'm smiling, but I, I gotta be honest with you. I'm more like Madame Tussauds, a wax figure. I'm just frozen. <laughs> oh my God. So if I ever do it again, I'm wearing something very warm and, um, uh, not giving a crap about what it looked like. <laughs> so. In front of uh, Man's Chinese Theater over there, that's where they have the stands set up, and that's where the television cameras are. So you kind of go there first, which is not a bad idea, because if it's towards the end, people are going to be freezing or all wrapped up, or maybe they've bailed out and decided, I'm done with this. And so if they do it early, you're looking fresh. 
I guess. Of course, and the cars, the parking lot's right there beside Grom, and so they use a parking lot in one of the buildings where they have right. a stack. They take out the whole place, and they have all their cars there, and then they swing the car around. There's a green room, because I think they use a storefront for a green room. I don't even, it's so funny, because when you're there, you don't really pay attention, because you're so busy trying to figure out what to do. They put you in the car, you meet your driver, and usually the driver's the owner of the car, you know, and they do it every year, mm -hmm. and they enjoy it, their little Christmas thing, and you're put in with a couple other people, and uh, and away you go. And yeah, that first that red carpet and that first kind of see the stands and everyone kind of stops, you wave. Um, I just thought it was that one block. I didn't realize it was really like a four mile parade with, and people line the streets. Like it's ridiculous. And so, yeah, so that's, so you do look fresh and fancy, but let me tell you when I came back around, I looked like I was 20 years older. Let me tell you, I mean, Jesus. So <laughs> now anyway, I, I know like the parades I have seen in new Orleans for Mardi Gras, they're throwing out beads and candy and all that kind of stuff. And now, is, is there anything like that? I mean, or do they just wave at you and you wave back or are you throwing out candy? Well, I, I think we have, I think at the time we had like peppermints and candy canes. And I think uh, somebody maybe threw some beads at me. So, you know, I showed them one, you know, one part of my chest because that's what you do in Orleans. I thought, point out the right thing for a Christmas parade for kids. So yeah. I stopped that. Um, but I look great though. It's so cold. I mean, I've never looked better. Um, chiseled. Because you're um, tight. Like an iceberg. <laughs> but no, it's, you throw candies and you have some like um, little peppermint candies and stuff like that. And people run up and take pictures and that. So, so it's mm -hmm. a really cool thing. And it's really a nice family thing for the um, the families to come out, hang around the streets and kind of see something really. Because, you know, they're, they're, the cars are almost every block. So there's not really a lull. You're you're really seeing a lot of stuff as they go by. But right. definitely right. if you do it, though. Dress warm. That is my advice. Personally. Advice to anybody who's going to be getting into that parade. Uh, now, I know that you've been also traveling a whole heck of a lot here during this past year because I've been watching over on Facebook that you from time to time been going to New York or Iowa. I mean, from big city to small burg, you know, to farm town to, uh, you know, big city. So uh, working in comedy clubs and everything like that. Is that kind of a little bit of a new direction for you or is that just something that uh, um, – is opened up to you or what? Well, you know, I'm open to any kind of performance venue because now at this point in my life, I've done, I've probably worked every kind of stage possible. And I love going back to the comedy club stages. Like recently, last week, I was in Burbank, California, uh, you know, which is right beside Hollywood, playing Flappers Comedy Club. And it's been there for years, old school club. And they have, you know, all the stars swing in there to, to run new material and that. And so I was doing a 9.30 headlining show. And at 7.30 was Jay Leno. And I'd never met Jay before. And I'm telling you right now, I've met a lot of celebrities in my life and been really honored to meet uh, many. And he, I got to say, he's probably the nicest celebrity I've met in years. I mean, along with Alice Cooper and a bunch of other friends, but he was unbelievable. And, you know, watching his talk show and that, and I know it's a business and it's corporate. So I didn't really care for him as a, a talk show host because, you know, you got to follow the script and you got to do your thing. But everyone I've talked about, uh, in the business before he got the Tonight Show. He's like, he is one of the ultimate professionals. He's so good. He kills when he goes on stage. But I never saw his comedy club set. So I only judged him off the Tonight Show. You yeah. know, and of course, I'm judging him against Johnny Carson, which I was a huge fan. And then I got to meet him in the green room. Him and his wife were literally sitting in a green room, no bigger than anyone's walk-in closet, like with chairs that have been there for 100 years and writing on the wall. And he's sitting there. And the guy's worth, what, half a billion? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, dollars, you know. And he's sitting there eating chicken wings with his wife in a suit, getting ready to go on like everyone else there, whether you've done <laughs> comedy for a year or as long as he has, super nice guy. Um, I said, hey, could you, could I get a photograph with you? He's like, oh my God, I'd be honored. I'm like, really? Oh, you'd be honored? <laughs> like, I thought, what a great line. I'm going to steal that. It just felt, made me feel great because I know yeah. it's, it's a line and it's what he says, but I thought, what a sweet gentleman. So we talked for another 10, 15 minutes about cars. And when he started back in Vegas and, and about Harry Basil, who's the producer, and the GM of the Laugh Factory here in Vegas. And he knew everybody, you know, and it was just a really cool hang. It was like sitting around you and I talking, you know, when you stay at my house, yeah. just kind of BSing. And I'd never met the guy in my life and just a really, really sweetheart. And I was standing there watching him before he went on and he came beside me because I was in the comedy club and uh, the guy was finishing his opening act. And he looks at me and goes, well, I guess I, I guess I better punch in now. And away he goes and, you know, <laughs> he does his hour and he walks on there and it's just like a ballet. Every move Every word, every look is choreographed. He doesn't waste one word mm -hmm. on anything. And he is the ultimate stand-up, like Seinfeld and Billy Crystal. Like, they're they're just, it's an art form. You know, when you see somebody work that smooth and that good, you sit back and go, you really question your own act. You kind of go, wow, there's a lot of 
if and and buts i don't need in my show you know so well they're doing it and have been doing it for so long it does seem to be something that would come natural although a lot of comedians of course are having to update their acts with uh, new material all the time and everything then too uh so they have to try out some new things but i think it's kind of amazing at his age and he's closer to me than he is to you in, in age. So I would think that uh, at some point it's kind of like, you know, I'm kind of done with that. Like David Letterman. I don't see, well, I don't know that David Letterman really a, was, he never worked the comedy clubs the way that Jay Leno did. But That's um, right. <clears throat> now yeah. you think that it's interesting when you say that he's a great guy and a lovable fella uh, that you could have, if you would have had that relationship with him while he had the TV show, uh, the Jay Leno show on this night show that you could have uh, been one of his guests. I think he, so. Definitely. You know, okay. I mean, I don't know if at the time when he was on, if my act was good enough or I was funny enough or whatever now for sure. You know, I feel I've got enough great material. I've done a thousand times that I, you know, or 10,000 times. Uh, but yeah, for sure. I think, I think he had a lot of his favorite acts on, you know, like Joan Rivers back in the day and yep. a bunch of different acts. Monty Rock, who was an old fifties singer that, you know, if somebody dropped out, they could just call and put somebody in and do four or five minutes. And I mean that when you get that, that level, you have a friend that connected. It's a beautiful thing. It's almost like me on Pawn Stars with Rick, you mm -hmm. know, every time Rick and I hang out, he goes, just, you know, you're a great guy. I've known you since the beginning. And, you know, I will guarantee you one episode every season we do on Pawn Stars. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need me on the show. And, and it's just nice to have that relationship. And he's just a cool guy and he's paying it forward, you know. So I think Jay did that for a lot of people that he knew that were great, you know. And then here's a killer thing that you won't believe this. He's doing a comedy club with 200 people in it. He sells it out. I think his tickets are 32 bucks or 35. Mine were 30. And he sold the club out. So I don't know what you'd make off that, maybe six grand if, if you had all that up properly. Um, but he doesn't take any money. It all goes hmm. back to the club. He pays his opening acts, you know, um, but it all goes back to the club. So he's not doing it for the money. He's doing it because he doesn't not want to be great. Because when he does do shows, you know, his shows, his show fee is like around 150000 a show. So yeah. when he goes out there to tour or do a corporate, you know, he wants to walk on as fresh as anything mm -hmm. and it goes back to the the you know the the old theory i don't care who you are in the business of magic or dance or entertainment if you want to be great at what you do you need to exercise that like going to the gym every day mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or like brushing your teeth every day you know, i know we talked off camera before this but you know you want nice bright white teeth got to brush them every day not once a month or once whenever you feel like it same with your act same with magic, same with comedy, because it's a muscle. And you can tell when somebody walks on stage, like a Matt King or myself, I guess, you know, I've been doing it long enough now, or Tape Face or any of these guys in Vegas. And it's beautiful to see something they've done over 10,000 times. And it just is a beautiful piece of art when you see a, an act, you know? And and that's that's really what it gets down to. And I tell a lot of magicians this. I said, I don't care if you're doing rest homes, charity shows, and maybe you're not getting paid the money you want. But to get the money that you want, you have to be as good equaling the money you want. And if you're not working mm -hmm. enough, you got to keep you got to keep the the car oiled. You know, you got to go somewhere and just keep working the act. Um, so when you do get a good booking, if you're not working consistently, because it happens in the business, obviously, you still got to be at the best of your you know ability. You know? Yeah, you really have to have those ten thousand hours in order to become the expert. You know. Yeah, and then after you have ten, yeah, and after you have ten thousand hours, you can't take six months off. You know what I mean? Like you That's know because you'll forget like you can have 10,000 hours, but if you haven't done it for six months, it's not going to be a smooth ride that first night out. It's going to be, it'll come back, but it's not going to come back like that last show you did after that many shows. Like even mm -hmm. Roseanne, she came to Vegas, did her show after doing the sitcoms for years. We're talking like six, seven years ago. This is before she got canceled again, but um, I watched her set and she had a teleprompter because, you know, she hadn't done comedy for years. Yeah, It was okay. It was okay. And then about, Six weeks later, I went to watch her, and she was back in the game again. She was so good. Having so her timing. Clean. Yeah. Oh, yeah, beautiful. But that was the first time she'd walk on stage doing that for years, and that must have scared the heck out of her because when you already have this level of she's got to be this good, that scares you because now you have to – people are assuming that. You know, mm -hmm. The you expectations there. Yeah, yeah. So that's – especially when you're that yeah. famous and that, you know. So it's very interesting to see how she really honed herself. And, of course, she did shows at the Laugh Factory here in Vegas, a couple hundred seats before she went on the road and did bigger venues because she needed to work stuff out and, you know, get it back on track. You know? A lot of things are a lot of the, the goal for a lot of comedians, I think is to try to get uh television 
you know, sitcom or something kind of like Jerry Seinfeld did, uh, or maybe a, a, a talk show like Jay Leno did and some of the other guys then as well. But uh, I know you've had a couple of specials that have been on television uh, as well. And you had the, um, uh, the one that was filmed, I know at the Plaza and I haven't talked with you uh, since the other one was, is that ready to go? Is that in yep. the works or what's the status on the second one? It is. Yeah, it is. So we just finished editing it about a month ago with my team, Atomic Television, who uh, was the producers on this one. And uh, it turned out great. We shot two two shows, a three and a seven o'clock uh, back in August. Was that the Plaza started. also? No, that was actually at the South Point Casino oh, yeah. uh, here in Vegas. And they have a really cool LED wall and lights and LEDs. They're really cool. And I was going to do mine in a smaller kind of club setting. So I wanted that difference because the plaza was like 650 people. And I thought we kind of have something more intimate, like a real comedy club. Yeah. And then this kind of landed on my lap. Cause I know the entertainment director, Michael Lebanotti, and he's wonderful. So why don't you do it here? I was like, you know what, what the heck, why not? So we did. And, um, and it was fun. It was a lot of new stuff, a lot of different stuff that I worked on. And, uh, and it's crazy you're going out there with some new stuff and you're hoping it all works right. Even though you do it enough. When you tape it, that's when you really need to go well, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but we got it done. The trailer's uh, done now as well, and we're just about ready to sign a deal this week, if not next, because obviously we're right now is a Friday. We're you and I are talking on, but next week hopefully uh, we'll have something signed, and then we'll have a um, a deal where I can tell what network is going to go on. Tubi has a first right of refusal. I don't think they're buying anything for the next six months to a year because they have a new CEO. So I don't think it'll be on on Tubi, uh, but I know we've had offers from Amazon Prime and a couple of others. So it, it'll be out there, but it's all ready to go. It's in the can, all edited, and we're pretty happy about it. But, you know, when you're editing your own video, though, and I'm not physically editing. I mean, I'm sitting there looking at the edits. The other guys are doing it. When you watch yourself for four weeks over and over, nothing is funny anymore. Nothing's magical. Yeah, everything's horrible. I don't like anything about it. There's I'm thinking, oh my god, am I really going to put this out there? Because you just nothing's because you just watched it so many times, and so that's where I'm at where, with it right now. Where I haven't watched it for like about three weeks because, and I'll probably never watch it again because I just I'm not one to do that. Just need to step away from it. But the current one is on Tubi. T T U B I for those people who perhaps yeah. haven't seen it yet. Uh, that is a, yeah. a a free app that you can put on to your TV. Yep. It is. And so that one's done really well for us. So we're excited to have this one to come out as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm excited that it's all new material, completely different. And, um, and yeah. Well, was it so, because you know, of the first one that uh, they saw, people saw that, or the executive said, yeah. hey, we have had good numbers. Let's do this again. Yeah, I had great numbers. And I said, let's do another one. And I'd already planned on doing another one because, you know, when the iron's hot, you want to strike. And so I thought, well, since we're doing that, let's let's keep it rolling. So that's that's kind of how all that happened. Speaking of so strike, had that uh, writers and actor strike affected you or Las Vegas at all? A little bit in the sense of I got no additions, you know, because I'm SAG. I'm a Screen Actors Guild member. So everything shut down in that sense. So I got no additions for anything, you know, no mm-hmm. callbacks, none of that stuff. So now that they're back to normal again, now we're getting additions again and stuff like that. So, yeah, it does affect everybody. You know what I mean? It mm-hmm. affects, does it affect the bigger stars like who are say friends, you know, cause obviously we just lost a friends cast member recently. And a few others who really have these hit shows where their residuals are still coming in, like, you know, like a water fountain, but right. it's the other ones that do piece work here. You get one, two, three things here, which all those things, when you get residual checks after a while, they really couldn't support you too much unless you actually had a really big series that was in syndication, you know? So, um, so it's nice. It's having a lot of people go back to work, get additions and get back out there, you know? So. Right. Right. Well, Talking about Las Vegas, uh, tell me about kind of what's been going on. One of the things that I think has been the biggest thing to me uh, that I've heard about was, uh, of course, the David Blaine uh, performance there at the Hilton. Or what is the Hilton called? Uh, it was actually Conrad Hilton and Resorts World. So it's Resorts a World, Hilton, yeah. But we call this Resorts World, yeah. <clears throat> and he was just doing that once a month or one twice a month or he had a few dates in there, like every few weeks, and he had certain blocks. So every three weeks for like three months or something. I don't know what the exact pattern was of his shows. He'd do like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then he hurt his back something by falling or something like that. But, you know, I know a few people who work at that actual theater. You know, I know a lot of things because I know, I know somebody at each theater in Vegas somewhere you know, yeah. that can give me information. But, you know, that theater is a 5,000-seat theater. That's a big room. 
Yeah. And I heard now this is don't you know quote me on this, but I heard, which makes sense, I've heard from two or three people now, that you know, he's only selling about a thousand tickets, you know, or a little higher, a little lower, you know, because the five thousand mm-hmm. seat room is a big, big room, you know. Right. I mean, Katy Perry was in that, Luke Bryan, all these people. So so I think also I think the room is a little bit too large for him. Yeah. I'm a fan of David Blaine, you know, but but I just feel like you gotta know your market sometimes. And I feel like that that room is a bit large. So he, I know he canceled his last two shows and he said it was his back or his shoulder. Whether that was really the case or the numbers were just low, who knows? You know what I mean? So um, he hasn't been there for a while? He hasn't been there for a minute, but now he's going over to the Wind. But see, the Wind Theater uh, is around 2,500 seats. So it's half mm-hmm. the capacity. So now that's definitely more in the vein of what he's selling. You know what I mean? And okay. Can sell, you know yeah. what I mean? It won't so, look like know, it's it empty. Will, that's right. So I want you know that the, the number one thing in business is know your worth and don't kid yourself. You know you can mm-hmm. fake it till you make it and all that, which we all do. But personally, know what you're really capable of. You know what I mean? Because because if not, you'll go into a theater or a venue too big for you. And, I think we you know, I think we may have talked about this last year, uh, but uh, we can probably uh, refresh us then again of what's new with Chris Angel because I remember he had his. Um, Mystica show that closed last fall, I think. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah, been about a I year. Mean, yeah, yeah. So, and then like he that. focused all of his attention just on his uh, on his show. Yes, yeah, he focused that, and um, and so now that's all he's doing now. And he's been very smart, like we all are, of scheduling his certain dates on when he's going to have his show and when he's not, because at the end of the day, you want a full theater. You know, mm-hmm. he's got a lot bigger cast than I have. Um, so like, even like this week here in, in Vegas, or at least this year, we're doing the F1 race, which is the formula one race, mm-hmm. you know, and that's new for us here in Vegas. And it's a big deal, obviously more European than, you know, than NASCAR for us. Um, but this weekend's a wash for shows. There's everyone's canceling shows, you know, Cirque du Soleil has Spiegel world. I think Chris Angel's canceled his cause people can't even get into the theater cause you can't get to it because the racetrack goes around the, um, you know, hotel. So how mm-hmm. do you get to the hotel, you know? so Right, because they had to block things. off those streets because of the racetrack. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. exactly. So there's a lot of concerns for that. So a lot of people have canceled their shows. I'm lucky because my shows now run Sunday through Wednesday. So I actually had them at the right time because um, it wasn't busy. People who were coming in early got to see my show. So I did quite well. And then I'll go back and do my show Sunday as well again which could be hit or miss because I think that that's the main race day, I believe. Um, but, but I know Friday, Saturdays uh, are qualifying days. What about le- leading up to that? Did they close the streets down as well while they were setting yeah. up all the, yeah. They did. Yeah. They closed streets down. Then they opened them up again. And it's kind of fun. So I went down to see the sphere, you know, that big, big globe that everyone's talking about. I was going to bring that up like, next. Yeah. Yeah. I just went and saw that about three days ago and uh, phenomenal, but to get there, you have to gr- drive the actual racetrack, which is funny because, hmm. Normally, I just say we just have to take Spring Mountain, which is where how I get there. That's the name of the street. Yeah. Uh, but now it's part of the racetrack. When you're driving down there with your regular car, it's pretty wild seeing the big metal cages with the advertising and the lights every six feet over you. Like it's just pretty wild seeing it. It's kind of like hmm. watching pole position when you used to play it back in the nineties. You know. <laughs> well, we had when I lived in Houston uh, many years ago, we had uh, that F1 that they had to block off all the streets around downtown and everything too. And it was just a one-off deal. They did it that one year and then never did it again. So I don't know if they're going to come back to Vegas or not. I mean, it seems like that Vegas is just getting bigger and bigger as far as all the different kinds of things that are being built. Uh, and uh, that like with the um, football field, so that you've got the Raiders there, that's been large. And uh, soon I guess they're going to be tearing down to your place with Tropicana and uh, yeah. putting up a, a baseball field. So what's That's what's correct. happening with that? Tell that may be yeah, a surprise I mean, to some people. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that, but you know, people don't realize that that corner of Tropicana and Las Vegas Strip is the busiest intersection in the United States. Isn't that really? wild? Yeah, huh. that's the busy. It's crazy. I didn't know that because that's the first exit off uh, of the freeway that you, to hit the strip. Really, yeah. that most people take when they're coming into um, you know when they're coming to Vegas from California, Utah. So yeah, so but so if you look at Trop. It's two towers that are miles apart from each other on this huge flat piece of land with no parking structures, all ground parking. And most hotels have parking structures because there's not enough land. So that's how much land the Tropicana actually has. So it was bought by Bally's Corporation, and then they made a deal with the Oakland A's. And they've been talking about coming here for years. 
And so realistically, the Golden A's will not play here until 2028. So that's a ways away. I mean, yeah. It's not happening overnight because they have to get clearances and everything else. But I guess I just read in the paper today, all 30 members or people who own the uh, Oakland A's all signed off and agreeing moving it to Las Vegas. So I guess hmm. that's on its way here. Um, now, my problem is, though, of all the teams we can get, I'm not a sports guy, but every time I've seen an Oakland A's game, there's like 10 people in the stands. So, well, you know, all the teams we could buy, are we really, are we doing that? You know, maybe they got a good deal. I'm assuming. Yeah. I, I hope the hell they did, you know, so I'm sitting back going, you know, what are we doing? You know? And then of course, putting it where, where they're planning on putting it, this is the Tropicana. We have so much land here. We have between here in Phoenix, Arizona, here in Los Angeles and here in Salt Lake city, there's so much land in Vegas and we're jamming it right on the same areas. And I just sit back and I just don't know why, that's necessary, maybe for convenience or whatever. I think it'd be convenience. Uh, it's an easy walking distance, and there are a lot of hotels around. Then it's like if we've got nothing else to do. Let's go see an afternoon game or an evening game yeah. or something. So when you yeah. say there are a few people in the park currently in Oakland, I think that they are making a wise decision in moving to Vegas. I mean, as far as first the uh, Oakland Raiders move, and then you know next that the A's are going to be moving. I mean, where are they going to have a professional table tennis team left? I mean, there's not going to be much there, you know. I know. I know exactly. So, um, but as you know, in Vegas, not many people walk here in Vegas, you know, because people think that looks close. It's just right there. They, just right yeah. there. <laughs> and by the time you leave your room, get to the front of the hotel and then take the bridge over because you can't just cross streets here. A lot right. of people don't know that. You can't just run across the street. We have barriers because we have problems all the time. So the only way to cross the street is on an overpass that you have to find to get you over the street. So yeah. even though you might be right beside the street, these is huge 10 foot metal kind of fences that look very ornate. Mm -hmm. um, you can't get over them. And if you can get over them, you can't get over the other side. So you, I've seen people stuck on the street thinking, okay, I'll just hop this, screw it. And they get across <laughs> and now they're stuck on the street because they can't get back over the other fence right. to the other side. So now they got to walk all the way down, you know, half a mile down the street to where it breaks in. So, so yeah, the walking kind of thing, most people probably Uber and stuff, but, but, you know, I think it's, if you look at the way it's going, they have so much land. So I'm surprised the hotel hasn't been sold or wrecked sooner because there is so much land there to do stuff with. Uh, but they are, from what I hear, keeping our tower up, which is where the shows are and the gambling. Because mm -hmm. the other tower is towards the back, which is towards the airport where they're putting the field. Right. And that's just hotel rooms. So knocking that down, they're not really not going to lose much. But to keep the gaming, the bars open, the restaurants and the shows, they can still bring in, um, you know, revenue and not get rid of the whole place until they're ready to. So I think that's the plan right now. Um, and then, I, so we're there, I assume, I, from what I've heard, we're there for the next year, you know, until the end of next year. And until the end of 24. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then mm -hmm. we'll move somewhere else. And I'll move to the Laugh Factory, wherever they decide to go, because they've been good to me. It's a big brand. I love their, you know, their world, their stage, all that stuff. So Right. Um yeah. We were talking earlier about how that people like Jay Leno and others are working these different clubs. And that reminds me of Rodney Dangerfield, who would work his club then also. And didn't the Laugh Factory there also used to be known as Dangerfields? It was. I think it was only open for like six months with his name on it. But it was his club originally. And then it became the Comedy Stop or the Trop Stop, I think, for comedy. And mm. then after that, it was Brad Garrett's. And then Laugh Factory. Oh, Brad moved over to the New York, New York or someplace, didn't he? No, he moved to uh, MGM. MGM, yeah. That's right. So, so yeah, so that, that's where he's at. But did, he's doing quite well. Did Rodney Dangerfield ever actually work at that at his club there? It was named after he him? Did. Yeah. He, he'd come in from, yeah, Rodney would come in from LA, drive a lot, and he'd come and do, he'd perform his own club and all that stuff. Oh, for sure, yeah. I'm not sure why it only lasted six months. I have to ask my manager because, um, uh, who runs the, the place there because he um was friends with him knew him very well very tight with him yeah he's you know he's it was like his father so i have to mm -hmm. ask him how that actually happened or what really happened there so yeah uh, it's interesting so yeah. there are some other uh shows tell me is anything else kind of opened or closed or something that um has really been hit hit out of the park or not well i know i know going into last year into this year, which is now we're obviously at the tail end of this year, I know Xavier's show that was a stress for that closed um, at the end of last year. I think he did a New Year's show, and then that was the end of that. So his his show hasn't been in Vegas for this year. He's been touring and doing stuff. Um, I know Late Night Magic, which is my buddy's show, Lefties. He's opened up at the Orleans Hotel now. 
So he's over there, uh, mm-hmm. which is great. And I know he was there doing shows during uh, Magic Live. So he's rock and rolling there. Um, Tape Face has moved from Harris to MGM Grand. He's actually in Brad Garrett's old room. And Brad moved upstairs to a brand new comedy club. So that's who? So that's Kate who? Tape Face. Oh, Tape Face. Pardon Tape me. Face. Yeah. Really yeah. famous act from ATT. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so that's, you know, and then Awakening, which is a new show uh, over at the Wind's been opening and closing, opening and closing. So now I think they've kind of got to figure it out. So um, that's been running consecutively now. And actually has magic in it as well. So they've been and sleeping and awakening and sleeping and awakening. Exactly. That's about <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and then that's about it. I mean, some shows haven't never come back from COVID and some shows there's talk about it, but, but it's a different world now, you know, when back in the seventies and eighties, um, you know, we talked about this before, I'm sure that there's only 12 or 18, 20 shows back then during in Vegas. Yeah. So it would always be full or always sold out, but now there's like 76 shows a night. Holy plus cow. The big, yeah. Plus the headliner shows, plus T-Mobile, plus Allegiant, plus football, plus hockey. So, you know, and people can only come in and do so much for a couple of days. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's definitely a lot more challenging um, than, than it used to be back in the old days. Well, I just had heard also or read where the Jen Kramer was celebrating her 600th performance. Um, mm-hmm. And I think uh, Gary Carson also, I think, was doing his 500th. And I believe Banachek also was doing his 600th. So I know some people have had some staying power there and are celebrating some pretty good number of shows. Yeah, yeah. People are hanging in there and, and they're making whatever deal deal they're making. They're doing a good job. You know what I mean? On what they're making, you know, yeah. Um, and trying to figure out the new sh- one new show that I've seen pulled in to town. And we were um, invited to a show is Jay Owen House and he has his Tigers in town. Hmm. So Jay Owen House had a big touring show back in the day with the big rigs. So he, what he's done is he's actually set up a tent in an open lot right across from Mandalay Bay. And um, has his tractor trailer out there with his face on it with the, the tigers there. And we were invited last week to go see his show. I couldn't make it. I was at a wedding. But some of my friends went. And I guess they got there. And supposedly the power went out or something like that. So they couldn't oh do my. the show. Yeah, hmm. I noticed that everybody there. And somehow the generator or something didn't work. And that was that. So now they're postponed. So I guess they need some more permits or something to do the show. Which from what he said. So, but we wish him luck, you know, first time doing a Vegas thing. So, and yeah. uh, with the tiger, you know, and if he's using tigers and that, I wish him well. But man, that's a pretty touchy subject these days with these, you know, with everyone from PETA and animal rights and all that stuff. So. I would think there would be some difficulty with that. I was also going to bring that up as far as Dirk Arthur having recently passed, and he also worked with the uh, big animals then as well. Do you know what happened to his animals or if anybody? I don't know. I think they're trying to be re rescued to other, other, um, Habitats. Places that actually habitats yeah. and places that actually rescue other tigers and that, you know, and he loved those cats, you know, and it's a shame that we lost him at such a young age, you know. How um, old was Dirk? I think he was in his early 60s. I want to say 63, yeah. something like that. Mm-hmm. Not that old at all. And, um, but it was, it was sad, you know, because he had one, one of those big shows, like I said, in Nassau, Bahamas, at Crystal Palace and at Merv Griffin's Island back in the day before Atlantis was built there. And he did some shows in town here, but you know, the last five, six years wasn't really too kind to him. You know, I remember I went to Westgate to see Barry Manilow's show mm-hmm. and he took my ticket. He was taking tickets, you know? Oh, wow. And he was doing you know, anything to keep alive. <laughs> that's right. You know, Hey, I don't blame for you. I don't yeah. ever knock anybody willing to work, man. You nope. know, life is not, not easy. And, but it was, it was really, um, I had a really hard time getting over that mentally. I'm thinking, Wow. You know what I mean? That that was a rough one for me because that can happen to any of us. You know what I mean? Sure. I don't care what job you're in, whether you're a magician, doctor, lawyer, real estate. Um, you know, we got to be lucky for where we're at because, um, you know, the next the next year could be a different story. So well, having, gotta, having a big you know. show like he did, I would imagine he would have had a lot of expenses, not just to pay for the theater, but also feeding his animals and caring for them, putting them up someplace. And then his different assistants paying for stage time and rehearsal and hauling them back and forth. I mean, first of all, it's a hard life physically. And second of all, I just think it would be taking a lot out. I mean, it may sound like you make a lot of money as far as what the contract might be for, but at the end of the day, you're not taking home a lot of money. That's the thing, you know, people don't realize that um, these days, you know, that, that, you know, when you're given a salary that nowadays is usually taken out of your salary. So if you get 10 or $20,000 for say a show at a casino, 
Um, they're going to give you the room and the food while you're there, some internet and transportation from the airport to the venue and back. But they're not shipping your equipment. They're not paying for it all that. Back in the old days, they would. That'd be kind of included above and beyond your fee. And it's also when gas prices were lower, shipping was lower, flights were lower, all this right. other stuff. Right. And now it's not that way. So when somebody hires you, they kind of want to go, here's what I'm paying you. I don't care how you get it there, but that's the show I want. So you can pull it, push it, fly it, whatever they want to do. But we're not taking that responsibility because because that's a really big nut. To, to, you know, like just for a tube zag illusion like I have, people yeah. call it cube zag. I call it tube zag. But um, that, that, you know, that case, if I were to ship it, say, halfway across the states, maybe to Texas where you're at and back, that would be around $4,500. You know what I mean? Just for that one illusion. Yeah. One trick. And it's three minutes of my show. 4500 bucks. So I'm making 20 grand for a show. I've lost a quarter of my salary just doing getting three minutes of a trick there. Wow. You know what I mean? And so that's a problem. Now, when you're touring, you have a bus and a trailer or a truck and your thing is bumping city to city. That's fine because you're towing it a little bit of extra gas, but at least it's you're only going 100 miles or maybe 500 miles to the next city. Mm-hmm. But when you're doing a one or two nighters and you want to, and you, you know, you, there's, and there's no way you could fly to New York and then do your next show in Miami. Like it just wouldn't, you can't do that, you know, with, yeah. with that, that equipment, you need a break. So that's why years ago I switched, of course, everything. I only do illusions in town now, you know, for corporate shows and that. And I only have two or three because I want to make more money, you know? So that's when I started working on being funnier, more entertaining with smaller items that I can pack in four suitcases and hop in a plane, you know? I remember and, Franz Ferrari uh, telling me once about how that he would always have something being shipped. I mean, in other words, you've got something going to this country or to this location. So you always have something that you're you're working on, you know, that's yeah. going to be there. Uh, because if you just got one show and you're traveling with that show, yeah, you're not going to make a lot of money. But if you've got different things going, by the time you get to there yourself, your equipment's already there, you know, so you may have to have yeah. multiples even of the same trick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyone listen to this, you know, if you're doing big illusions and stuff, it's lovely and it looks fun and sexy and, you know, it's, and it's one of those things that you don't need a LED wall or a screen for because you can see a trick like that from the 20th row, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you really want to make money, be more entertaining, be funny, be entertaining, you know, put your talent into yourself, not into a box with some blades or something like that. There's some cool ideas out there. Uh, and I'm sure the builders don't like me saying this, but <laughs> but at the end of the day, I got to pay my mortgage. So learn to be more entertaining on your own, you know, with a yeah. mic and a stool and a deck of cards or something like that. Um, and realistically, at the end of the day, you'll actually go further. Like I said, going back to Dirk Arthur, I really think that's what did him in because, you know, I saw his show without the Tigers and that. And he's a good guy, but it just wasn't as entertaining as the Tigers because he spent all his life making it about that, you know, and that's fine. But that's a really, really big nut, to, you know, to pay off every week, every month, trying to keep those things happy, alive, caged, insurance, all that stuff. You know what I mean? Well, there are fewer and fewer illusionists. Whenever I go to magic conventions, and I went to a dozen this year, I would probably say I can count on the two hands, the number, except for, I guess it was one. Anyhow, most conventions do not have illusionists. I'm just saying. There, some of the people I saw, I saw more than once at some of these places because of the expense, as you said, of traveling to wherever. And as a result, uh, most people will they try to scale back, just as what you're saying. Try to be more funny. Try to pack flat. Play play big. Do more comedy, and uh, and and they are, and that's doing fine. But it sounds like that the old style magic shows. I mean, like let's say Blackstone and others that are touring shows are really soon going to be a thing of the past. I mean, I don't know how they can continue to profit and and uh, be successful. I, I know there are some touring shows that are out there and those who might be listening saying, hey, I'm doing just fine. Well, I'm sure that's right. Uh, but they, my point is, I think they're few and far apart, which is good for them because they don't have a lot of competition because it's uh, easy access and cheap access for most magicians to enter into the profession or the community by just buying a deck of cards, you know, and then learning how to do a few cool things and then working on an act from there. Yes. Yeah. It's definitely a big change of things. And also the environment, what's people wanting. And also, you know, I got to be honest with you, a lot of these illusionists, you know, unfortunately, just because you have the mind to buy something that looks amazing. And if you read the instructions and make it know how to work, doesn't mean you know how to perform it. 
You know what I mean? And what I mean mm. by performance means not get through it and it works. That that's not yeah. that's not performing <laughs> it. That's just getting through it and making yeah. it work. I can yeah. teach my mom that. I can teach my neighbor that. I can teach yeah. my gardener that. You know, um, that's 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 truly easy. where they say I want to. I can kill five minutes. And you're right. You killed five minutes. Boy, you know. did you ever? Yeah, you know. And I always tell people these, you know, magicians. They think once they buy an illusion, they can be a star, and you know, and they've got it. I'm like, well, learn how to dance or walk on stage. Don't be dancing around, flitting around like you're doing fiddler on the roof, pointing your toes and swinging arms around, I and mean, you look like an idiot, you know. Yeah. And that's just my own opinion. You know, God knows, everyone knows I have one, but. Um, and the reason I know that is that I was one of those idiots pointing the toes and doing the funny gestures back in the day, you know, so I, I'm preaching to the choir right now, but, but I also trained ballet and I danced for 16 years. I took acting lessons, you know, and I learned how certain things happen. And then also when I went to comedy, I went and did comedy clubs for three or four years as a comedian, not doing magic to learn how to fail or learn how a joke should be. So when I did say a joke, it would actually be funny, not just, you know, um, you know, a pleasant laugh that people felt like they had to get. And you knew why it was funny. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I look exactly. And so, you know, with these illusion people, buy the illusion if you're gonna do one of these things, but then take acting lessons or learn how to walk on stage. Learn when you're moving what you really want to sell, you know, and then look at yourself and go, Did I really want to watch that guy flitting around like that or that mm -hmm. girl flitting around like that? She looks like they're lost, you know, yeah. really have a reason. Or am I believing what you're doing? Like, is it really believable? Most of the time, I got to be honest with you, it's not. It just really isn't, you know? So so that's that's my advice for anyone out there. Don't, just because you buy a trick doesn't mean you can, you know, you can do it well. It just means you bought a trick and it worked at the end of it. Uh, but really work on, it's kind of like doing a monologue. If you're an actor or actress, you don't just read the monologue once. And just because you've memorized it means you can act it. That just means you memorize a damn thing. You don't need a mm -hmm. piece of paper anymore. You know, now figure out how to make those words mean something. Hold the pause on a word, lay back on a word, you know, maybe speak quickly for a section and then slow it down. You know, that's that's acting, you know, but mm -hmm. really figure out what the hell you're saying. Just because you memorize the monologue doesn't mean you can act it, you know. Let me also say, I think that you should be rehearsing the trick a lot to the point where it is flawless and you're more concerned about the audience rather than doing the trick. You know what's going to happen. I say that because one of the conventions I attended this year, I saw a guy doing wind shear. And if you never knew how the trick works, if you would have seen that performance, oh, so that's how it's done. I mean, oh, it, no. yeah. it was, it, it, yeah. you know, some illusions can be done bad to the point where it is exposure, basically. Yeah. And that's yeah. what this was, unfortunately, for a large audience uh, on, the, on the stage at a convention once, at a major convention. But, yeah. um, you know, those things happen to, to to all of us, I guess. But my point is, it shouldn't, you know, if you get to a certain point in your career where you have those things down and you've rehearsed those uh things that could go wrong enough so that they don't go wrong, you know? Oh, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And be comfortable. So if something does go wrong, you can confidently handle it and it doesn't throw you off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and it goes back to that 10,000 hours thing or doing at least enough times that, you know, every nook, cranny, jiggle, wiggle of that trick, or even if it's a, it's a something in a parlor setting yeah. where you're dealing with stuff right there that it's not going to put you out that much you know what i mean but it's yeah it's, it's really important and we people always ask well i don't how do i work enough when i can't get a gig or whatever right well, volunteer you know that's the other way like i said senior centers or schools or classrooms or whatever well, you've taken the words out of my mouth that was what i was going to suggest as well is to say people may say well where do i practice with these larger things well there are places that will be certainly willing to uh, give you a venue as you said uh, that could be senior retirement homes uh, they have community places with with nice banquet rooms and stages and everything and maybe schools and gymnasiums there are places where you can go to learn and kind of be bad if you will you have to everyone's got to be bad somewhere i mean yeah. i see a lot of times comedians like the jay leno story i mentioned a while back yeah doing a small comedy club in la um a lot of comedians have come through there and do drop a drop in they call the drop in set and it's like 10 minutes because they're working on something for a special and they just and they hit two or three clubs that night and it's free they don't want to get paid they just pop in it could be yeah. from kevin hart to a wayne's brother or whatever and you're like how are they doing this well because they need stage time because at home and on a piece of paper you're hilarious but when yeah. you walk on stage you don't know how great you are and that's why they're great at what they do because they've they've taken their time uh to really hone their craft and they also know what it takes to get it to the point they need it at 
when they're performing it. There was a television show uh, that actually was on the streaming channel a few years ago. And it wasn't a show. It was a, it was a comedy special about Jerry Seinfeld about this very thing in which he had a camera follow him for like about a year. And because he would walk into these clubs with that name, people were laughing already because they expected him to do his old bits, but he was trying out new stuff. And you can kind of see the audience going, huh? You know, it, that's not the joke I was expecting. It's kind of like going to see uh, a concert from your, you know, favorite performer and they're not playing the songs that are, you know, on their CDs or on their albums yeah. or whatever. You know, my point is that, that, yeah, you, you go to hear the old stuff, but they're playing new stuff. And the same thing here with Jerry, that he was trying to get his timing and trying to get the laughter to see what would work and what wouldn't. And it was just kind of a, an interesting um, biopic in a way of how that you do have to work on that and realize that y you, you can be funny, but, but it, there's a reason you're funny because you've had good lines, you've had good writers or that your delivery, your timing and everything has to be right. And so you're working on something new. Anyhow, that was just kind of an interest. I don't remember the name of the special. No, I want to I want to figure that out because I tried to look for that special as well. That's when he came back doing stand up after Seinfeld. Correct. And he hadn't played clubs a lot. And I wanted to find that it's a series or it's a thing. You can even buy the DVDs back in the day. Um, but I really wanted to find that because I wanted to watch that. And every time I go to search for the damn thing, I can't find it. So, yeah. do you remember um, what the so, name of it was? I don't know if I would, I could find a damn thing, but I can't. So, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. You think it wouldn't be that hard, but for some reason, I've looked a couple times now, can't find it. I really wanted to watch it. Yeah, you know perhaps mean? Uh, um, a check through IMDb with Jerry Seinfeld and you know, yeah. just look at the movies or whatever that he's been in. I want to kind of shift uh, the conversation here for just a moment to talk about uh, the social media and some of the things that you're working with. I always love talking with you about stuff that works and stuff that is no longer as important as it once was. And uh, it seems like that we're constantly finding new things or new ways to expand our audience. And you kind of have to keep riding that wave. You just kind of have to keep paddling that surfboard out to catch the next wave as one kind of passes. So have you got something or advice of some things that uh, have worked for you, but that are not as working as well uh, or some new things that uh, have replaced it? Um, you know, we're back to doing videos on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook and all that, you know, cause my stuff, a lot of people know that I was doing, uh, the blood of the police stuff, you know, and things like that. And uh, when the Black Lives Matter thing happened and a lot of the cop stuff, we got shadow banned because obviously our, our, you know, our channel was based on cops and that. So when you pick trendy topics or things that are a bit more questionable, you, you always run that risk. But I think trying to be different and not the norm is the way to get the reactions. Whether you have a TikTok, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, whatever you're doing, don't do it in a different way. You know, like perfect example is I was talking to a a morning host friend of mine here in town that had done the morning show for years. Now she's on her own thing. And I said, no one's doing this right now. I think you should do it. You can set it as a mock-up though. On camera, live events with a microphone like you see everybody here we go an earthquake just happened or it's raining here or big sale at right, the store right but i said we all love watching the bloopers of serious news reporters and like a giraffe bites the mic head off you know or right. whatever the heck it is but they're reporting said, on a hurricane and they get blown over or exactly something. Yeah. toupee flies off i mean just all yeah. this stuff and i'm like you don't it doesn't have to be real you can put dummy heads on your microphone but but you play it straight though and you have these scenarios, and I think that would be a really cool channel. I've never seen anybody really fully do that. Usually it's real-time stuff. Like, they just – they save it and they upload it with something that's really happened. Um, but I think that would be really cool. So here, here's a reporter who's very pro, but but just her talking to somebody interesting isn't going to get views. Like, you know, if she's interviewing me, you know, what's in this magic trick or what's Vegas like, it's not going to have many views. It's lovely, but it's not – but if I'm talking to her now, all of a sudden, and, you know, I um, produce a dove, and then the dove sits in her head and craps on her head, right. viral, instantly right. viral, because it's not supposed to happen. It's weird. It's Boyer-esque. It's something that, oh, my God, I can't believe they got that on camera. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that really is, you know, the golden nugget of that. Find something and then skew it left or right just a little bit. Don't be normal about it. And it's hard for a lot of people. Uh, but 
we all love a car crash. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that gets attention. So find something that you're good at, you know, with a trick or whatever it is, but then skew it somewhere that you can get a reaction. You know, and that's how I've made all my videos go viral because I've just skewed them a little off, you know, and now it becomes all of a sudden interesting, you know, and yet the trick will still work or whatever I'm trying to do, but you can, we can just change it a little bit. You know what I mean? You mentioned a little bit about uh, a while ago about that you, your, some of your videos because they're about police and some people don't like the police or whatever. Did you notice that there was a, a, a visible dip, I guess, in the, in the uh, analytics um, of, of your videos uh, long about that time? Yeah, there was. Yeah, because you can tell a lot of times they call it shadow banning where YouTube, Facebook will shadow ban you. So your your channel's still there, but they're not suggesting your posts anymore. Oh, they're not okay. sug- that little thing. They're not bumping into things. But if they want to push you, they can suggest right away. They can bump you into the next video once one finishes. So so when you're shadow banned, all of a sudden your views go from, you know, 100,000 all the, down to like 9,000. And you're like, well, that's wow. what are we doing here? Um, it's because it's just running on your channel and you're not really getting any help from whatever mm-hmm. platform you're using. You know what I mean? How many subscribers do you have currently? I know that it keeps growing every time I talk to you. Yeah, on YouTube now, we're almost at 1.8 million subscribers. I think mm-hmm. um, TikTok, 700,000. I believe Facebook, 700,000. So, yes, it's growing all the time. I think it's over five and a half billion views across all the platforms. How so, much time a day or a week would you say that you spend trying to create new content for that, for all those different, so, you know, well, Instagram and et cetera? Nowadays, it varies. I'm lucky because my YouTube producer now just moved from L.A. to Vegas. So he lives literally 15 minutes away from me now. So we can do a lot more, a lot quicker. Um, so we've been shooting the last three weeks, I'd say once, one day a, a week for like three hours, we do four to seven videos and that's good enough for an upload, you know, once every two days or once a week. So, and we'll look at things that might be interesting that might not be our latest one. I don't think we've uploaded it yet, but we have my uh, little chihuahua. She's only five and a half pounds, Kalua, and we put her in a little vest a nice secure vest, like one of those life jacket vests for when you take them in the water. Yeah. And then we decided to blow up helium balloons and tie them to her and see how many helium balloons we needed to make her float. To make the chihuahua <laughs> float. Yeah, funny. <laughs> yeah. And so we're, we haven't released that one yet. We, we actually did it enough times where we could actually get her to float. And it's hilarious seeing all these balloons attached to a little harness and she's floating with her little four paws <laughs> hanging. Now, how many of those? But it's that stuff. As I was going to say, those uh, are those ideas yours, or do you kind of have a brain trust uh, team of people that you kind of bounce ideas off of, or do you just say, "Hey, let's let's record this now"? Yeah, yeah, a lot of them will be my ideas, or Seth, who's my producer, Seth Leach, you know, or he'll see something that's trending online, you know, where they'll do maybe let's float my baby with helium balloons. And I go, great, well, let's use a dog, whatever. So mm-hmm. you see that kind of trend, and you kind of go, let's jump on it, you know, while it's while it's out there. So that's kind of what we do. And we're always searching on what's the newest thing, what's happening this week, what's, you know, what are people talking about or what's popping off. And then if you're smart, you jump on the trend right away because it doesn't last long. I guess it's kind of like with movies. Of course, they always try and have a sequel based upon the hottest movie that's out there then right now. If that, after that works and people are trying to do something kind of like that or whenever that you understand when people pitch a movie that they're talking with the studios and saying, well, this is a movie that's like such and such meets so-and-so. So you can kind of relate to those two movies. So again, they're trying to build on whatever success that is. So that makes perfect sense that you're like you just said, where they try to float a baby with balloons. It's like, well, let me think of how they can tie balloons to something else. Well, it would be great. Yeah. Exactly. So you kind of find that. And if you're smart, you kind of look at things like that and keep on the daily. But it's you got to look at it as a real job. You can't just wing it and think, oh, I'll just do this. You know, it'll go viral. You really have to. There's a lot of thought process. Things that look really haphazard mm-hmm. have a lot of you know, a lot of process within them. So as we start to close here, you're still uh, performing then, of course, at the Laugh Factory and the Tropicana. And then uh, later that evening, most of the nights uh, also for the fantasy. Uh, fantasy I finished about two months ago I did three and a half years there and then they decided to take out the guest spot she wanted to put in a couple extra dance numbers yeah so we finished that about six weeks ago two months ago so now I'm just at the Tropicana I'm doing that four or five days a week and then I'm touring on the road on the weekends and I'm actually playing the Magic Castle December 11th to 17th um 
this year for the holidays, which is kind of fun. I've never done that. And if you know anything about me, I love Christmas. Just so you or Lefty me also? Me and Lefty. Yeah, it'll always yeah. be me and Lefty there. Yeah. And uh, it should be fun in the big room, you know, the palace. Mm-hmm. So we're looking forward to that. You know, and of course, you know, Magic Council to Vegas is only four and a half hours. So it's, a, it's an easy drive for us. Right. Not very far at all. No. Well, it sounds like you kind of got your uh, Christmas planned already. So yeah. Um, anything that you uh, uh, plan to do uh, that will be really exciting other than when we get back from the castle, you're going to continue to work? I mean, if you got like a special, do you add anything into your show that is a Christmas jokes or tricks or something? I do a couple of Christmas things I add in, but usually I keep the show pretty much the same because don't forget – a lot of people come to Vegas that are Jewish. They're celebrating Hanukkah, True. you know, True. they yep. come from other countries and that. So um, I have done the odd Christmas show or Christmas charity show. I haven't done that this year uh, yet, but mom's flying in from Vancouver. She just turned 84 and she's doing amazing. Good. So she is. Um, yeah. So she's coming in next week for my birthday. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're doing that. And then uh, Thanksgiving, of course, and all that jazz. She's spending the month here. You know, and uh, we'll see shows and do all sorts. I'm actually taking her to see Inklebird Humperdinck, his Christmas special. Oh, my. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'd love to see around. that myself. 88. <laughs> yeah, 87 or 88 at the Orleans Hotel, actually. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and that's mom's era, you know, And I, but I still enjoy a good show. So we're going to that and a few other friends' shows in town. And, uh, and, you know, I just love Christmas. So, but I'm trying not to put the Christmas decorations up too early. I know I've got some friends putting up trees now. I'd, I kind of want to get through Thanksgiving. And then do that. I don't want to rush it too much, you know. And right. every year, I don't know how much stuff I'm going to put up because I have a lot of stuff. And every year at this point, I kind of go, ah, let's just put the tree up. And then because I have all the stuff, I go, well, why not put it all up? I have it. It's not costing me anything, you know. So That's right. So we'll just see. pull it out of storage and get it going. Yeah, I'm exactly. planning on doing a lot of uh, appearances at Santa Claus throughout this year. I'm yeah, gonna I be... know. How's it going? <laughs> you get, you're all lined up for that? I am. I've got several that are between Houston and Dallas. And one particular thing, I'm going to be starting like December 1st. That'll be for a tree lighting ceremony at a uh, out at a suburb outside of Chicago, uh, Houston. That will be for they said about 10,000 people. That's like from four until 8 p.m. that night. The next morning at 8 a.m., then I'm going to be in Dallas. Uh, for breakfast with Santa and Neiman Marcus. And so I'm just going to be driving back and forth and it'll be crazy. And the rest of my schedule for the month is like that. Yeah. I see (laughs) that you've grown a beard as well for the holidays. So I love that. Right. Yeah. I'm really anxious to get this shaved off. It's getting to be a little (laughs) bit unruly as far as it. You know, I'm trying to eat and there's some hairs getting my mouth. Like, ah, I got to cut it back, but it's got to be long enough to look good. It's like, oh, just another month. And then I can get back to um, <laughs> where it needs to yeah. be to shave it proper. <laughs> well, so when you go, I got to ask you a question. So when you do uh, the Santa Claus appearances, is when you go with the agencies, is there a requirement that the beard definitely has to be real or do you get better gigs if it is real? I mean, yes and yes. Uh, they look for real beard Santas. And that's the thing is that. And with real hair, rather than wearing a wig or something, even though that you might be having a hat on or whatever, sure. they prefer to have uh, real beard Santas because there are enough out there. So why should you settle for second yeah. best, basically, because kids don't get fooled the way maybe they used to in the 50s and 60s or whatever mm-hmm. so long sure. ago because, uh, you know, they can pull at your beard or they can tell whether it's real or not. <laughs> but yeah. It uh, is is something in which that I think there is a finite period in which that you can do Santas. I think it's probably between somewhere between 60 and 75 that you can probably get to that point where you have a gray look and beard and hair and then and also strong enough that you can actually put kids on your knee and talk to them and and be interactive and uh, not just be an old man, you know, so. (laughs) How long does it take you to grow your beard? When do you start growing it? Like in July? I keep it, you know, in in August. I keep this um, fairly well trimmed throughout most of the year, as you know. But then Mm -hmm. come August, I start just uh, doing nothing. I just let it, uh, (laughs) you know, bush out. And because I know that whenever that I get to the uh, actual venue, I'll probably brush it out like that rather than combing it down. So that way it looks even more full, you know? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, I love it. You kind of have that. Is it Randy Bachman? Bachman Turner on Overdrive. One of them had a yep. beard. I thought, didn't it? Is it Randy? Yes. Maybe. I believe that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> you got that look. Yeah. <laughs> well, Marissa, well, good always, for you. I'm excited. Good talking with you, and uh, looks like you got things uh, worked out uh, for your holidays uh, to be bright. And I wish you and Danny and your mom and everybody nothing but the best. So enjoy. 
Thank you, thank you. Danny sends her love and uh, wishes you a Merry Christmas as well. She's across the room waving at me. So, anyways, I love you <laughs> a lot, uh, Scott, and I uh, can't wait to see you again. The guest room is always open. Thank you. The sooner the better. I uh, always love spending time with you, man. Okay, I love you. So, love you. Merry Christmas from the Magic Merry Word. And that was Murray Sacco. Scotty out. Thank you, Murray, for again being my guest here this year, and I hope everybody had as much fun listening to that as I did having the opportunity to chat and catch up with you here again this year. And I hope everybody also gets what you want for Christmas, and I haven't had anybody who had you speak pipe this last week and send me a message, so that's why I haven't uh, posted anything. But if you would like to just do a shout-out and say Merry Christmas or Happy Hanukkah or anything like that to your friends, families, and neighbors— uh, please do. All you have to do is just go to the magicwordpodcast.com and you'll see the little thing you can click there called Speak Pipe and you can leave a message and up to 90 seconds. And uh, if you want to also just say what you want for Christmas, perhaps Santa might bring that to you if your best friend or your spouse or someone loved one is listening to this podcast, perhaps. Anyhow, I hope that you guys uh, come back again next week. And I hope also that you subscribe to the pod letter so you know who is coming up from week to week and also get some suggestions from the archives. Until next week, stay well, get booked, and Merry Christmas. This is Scotty out. <laughs>